Dawn was still some time away. I had risen early to prepare for my guests. I rekindled the fire. I swept. I kneaded the dough and began baking the bread. I was just going down to the stable to feed the animals when I saw a group of shepherds emerging from the cave. As they approached me, one said, God bless you. Another said, isn't it wonderful? And a third shouted out, good news. They had almost passed me by when I grabbed the last one by the arm and turned him around to face me. He had a look of bewilderment on his face as I asked him what he was doing in my stable. He replied, is that your cave? Then you, sir, are truly blessed. Before I could understand what he meant, he began chattering excitedly about a heavenly choir, an angel, and a newborn baby. I had placed a couple in the stable because all the rooms in the inn had been filled. She was in her last stage of pregnancy, but what could I do? There was no room at the inn. There were so many people in town for the census that all the rooms had been filled. While we were chatting on the pathway between the stable and the inn, he continued to be excited about the newborn child in the, in the stable. He excitedly told me he had to rush off and join the others, and I could see that there were several guests in front of the inn that were talking with some of his companions. There were other shepherds in the street talking with people, telling the story over and over. I returned to the inn and continued to feed my guests and take care of their needs. I went down to the stable and observed out of the corner of my eye that the mother and child were sleeping. The child was laying in the, in the feed trough. I threw the feed on the ground and returned to attend to my guests. I overheard several of my guests say that they were going to go down to the stable after they had eaten and look at this wonderful thing for themselves. I longed to go with them, but I had so much to do, and there was so little time left to do it. We, uh, we hear this story every Christmas, and we meet a character, the innkeeper. And we have these perceptions about who the innkeeper is, and I wanted to kind of throw our perceptions off a little bit, and so I made sure that our innkeeper had a handlebar mustache this year. You may recognize Chris. He makes the coffee for us. I appreciate his willingness to take a leap of faith this morning and stand up in front of you and, and to try to recite a monologue and to, to remember those details. And here's the, the problem with anyone coming to share those details. So much of what we know of the Christian Christmas story is, is, is taken from this story here and this story over there, and, and we take these little bits and pieces primarily of Luke and of Matthew, and, and where we don't have some of the details, we begin to, to imagine or fill in, and that's what the early church essentially did in the first few hundred years of the Christian church. Traditions began to develop about how things went down on that night. I share with you the thoughts that so often we hear of, of donkeys and a stable and a manger and, and donkeys are not mentioned in the scriptures and yet we are fairly certain that Joseph would have procured some animal to, to help Mary get down from Nazareth up in Galilee to head south to the hill country of Bethlehem. And so today as we conclude our sermon series, The Journey, we're going to look at the actual trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now, what's interesting is Luke doesn't really tell us much about the trip. We have to, to surmise from what we read to understand a little better about it, but most of us, when we hear the story of the baby Jesus born in the stables, and we hear the statement of the innkeeper that the baby's was the baby was born in the stable and placed in a manger because there was no room in the inn. Most of us assume a couple things. One, first, we assume that Joseph, like most men, 
didn't make the reservations for the vacation the way he was supposed to. (laughs) We assume that Joseph didn't ask for directions along the way. We are fairly certain. The scripture doesn't tell us, but we're certain that if they got lost, Joseph would not have stopped and asked for directions. We also assume that the innkeeper really didn't have a big heart because if the innkeeper had had a big heart, the innkeeper would have recognized that here's a pregnant woman. We've got to make better accommodations for a pregnant woman than the stable. I told you in the first two weeks of the sermon series, in fact, in week one, I shared with you that I was gonna tell you something about this story or this part of the story that maybe perhaps you had never heard before and that I was gonna propose to you that there is a practical reason why Mary gave birth to Jesus in a stable and that it has nothing to do with the conventional things that we think, all right? Some of you, when we came to the second week in the sermon series, asked the question, because we talked about how Joseph, even though he's referred to as Joseph from Nazareth, that Joseph's family was actually from Bethlehem. We know it because of the text we're gonna read today, that every family had to go back to their hometowns for the census. And so that's where we're gonna begin the story is with Luke's telling today of the census. Now the question we asked in week two as we began to explore this concept or this idea that Joseph was from Bethlehem, some of you then began to ask the question, if Joseph was from Bethlehem and that's where his family was from, then why, why didn't Mary and Joseph just stay with Joseph's family when they came back for the census? Why would they have had to look for other accommodations? And I told you that if you all came back for this Sunday, I would tell you the answer to that question. I think it's a practical reason. Um, It's not necessarily uh, definitive in every detail. We don't know, but you'll find from the reading of this story, there are so many details that aren't there. Um, Our greater appreciation for the fullness of the story is only gonna come from our trying to understand what is there and understand culturally what they may have been dealing with at the time. If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 2. We're going to read the first portion here, just verses 1 through 7. And if you're able, I will invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. So if you're able, would you please stand now for the reading of the gospel of Luke. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger. And the famous words, because there was no guest room available for them. May the Lord bless this reading of his holy word. I invite you to take a seat. I think in order to understand this passage, we need to look at three portions of the scripture, three details. The first is the census, so the fact that there was a census. The second is the route that they actually took to Bethlehem. And then the third is this concept of journey. You'll notice the sermon series title is The Journey. Um, I don't know how many of you would express being able to relate to this. Imagine all of you. But how often have we had plans or ideas about how our life was going to work out, and then somewhere along the way, it just hasn't turned out the way we'd expected? I mean, every one of us at some level has had that experience where, we, where we've started on plan A, we've gone probably past B and C, and we're on some other fourth or fifth option. Or how many of you have had something happen, maybe a difficult season in your life, and one of your well-meaning Christian friends said, you know, I know this is difficult right now, but in time, you're going to see how God can use this. In time, you're going to feel blessed. I wonder how many people said to Mary during this pregnancy when she was trying to explain what had happened, when people didn't believe her, Mary, you know, you're, you're so blessed. Uh, we know. We know that Mary felt blessed. She said so in her song, if you will. She sang. Uh, But it wasn't until there was already an affirmation. I mean, how many other people had told her she wasn't blessed before that, I wonder? As we consider that this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about 
um, marriage customs in first century Palestine, as, as best we know. It would have been typical for a married couple to have had about a year-long formal engagement, all right? And so I think the plan, if you want to talk about a journey or a plan, the plan for Mary and Joseph is that they would have a year-long engagement, that Joseph would prepare a place for them, most likely, most likely in either Bethlehem or Nazareth. We find out that they raised Jesus in Nazareth. We know that uh, from other details in the Gospels. Uh, And we also know that there was a town, and archaeologists have only more recently discovered some of the aspects of the town. It's not mentioned in Scripture. It's only referenced. Uh, There is one possible reference um, um, in talking about a city on a hill that can't be hidden. Uh, But there is a town of Sepphoris, which is about four miles from Nazareth. Uh, It was the big town. Nazareth was a no-name town. It was a backwater town. Remember I told you in that week when we talked about Nazareth that in all the mentions in the Jewish uh, scriptures and the Mishnah and in Josephus' account that uh, Nazareth out of 65 Galilean towns, Nazareth even, isn't even listed as one of them. The only reason we care and the world cares about Nazareth is because that's where Jesus was raised. Right? But very likely we talked about the fact that Joseph and his family would have been day laborers, would have been carpenters that would have worked any construction jobs that would have come their way. They would have fixed farm implements, uh, wooden handles for stuff, maybe small stools, things like that. And they would have taken any work that they could get and most of the people that lived in Nazareth probably commuted into Sepphoris for work, all right? Very likely Jesus was raised going to the job sites as he got old enough to work and to follow in the footsteps of his father, which we, earthly father, we know that he became a carpenter himself, and that Jesus probably in his early years, in his teens and 20s, uh, went into his work in the big city with his dad and worked construction sites, probably from the time the sun came up till when the sun came down. All right, so that's kind of the context. We know that, so they would have had this formal engagement and Joseph would have made preparations for Mary Now, we're told in the scriptures, and we talked about this in week one, that Mary goes down to visit her relative, Elizabeth. Some surmise she was a cousin, some think she was an aunt, but we know that she went down there to a town that wasn't too far from Bethlehem. We also believe that Joseph was most likely down in Bethlehem when word came to him that Mary was pregnant. Mary may have traveled over to Bethlehem to tell him, or we're not sure exactly how he found out, but we hear the account of an angel encouraging him not to divorce Mary, but to to go with the plan, even though it was unfolding in a very different way. So Mary begins to have to tell her story. Now, you have to understand something about this concept of a census. I think it's important for us as we try to understand this story and understand this, the context in which, so we can try to apply it to our lives or see some of the character of God in this, we have to understand that the census was... Luke's way, essentially, of placing them in Bethlehem. It's important for Luke that we understand they're in Bethlehem, and it's important for us to understand why that's important to Luke. You see, we have to remember that Judea and this entire region of Palestine, the Holy Land as we call it at that time, was an occupied territory of the Roman Empire. In fact, All of our stories, all of the context for our New Testament stories occur within the context of the Roman Empire being the empire of the world, the ruling uh, empire of that day. And so these were an occupied people, Mary and Joseph. And we hear that there was a census that was called for. And so even though they weren't Roman citizens, they still paid Roman taxes and they were still required to follow Roman laws. And so they are told, you, along with everyone else, all of you people that live in this region, even though you're not Roman citizens, we need to kind of get a handle on how many of you are are around, and so we can uh, also tax you. If we can get you in one place, we can uh, find it, and you can go back to your family properties, and we can assess the value. Uh, appraisal. I don't know if you ever had an appraiser come out to your place to, to decide what, uh, how much your stuff is worth, but I always think how funny this is. When it comes to selling our properties, we want them to be valued very highly. When it comes to taxing, taxing our properties, what do we want? Oh, low values, right? Oh, this place is a dump, right, when it's tax time, but when we're trying to sell it, oh, look at the granite countertops they're immaculate everything's being resurfaced or refurbished right so they all go back to their homes and I'm sure they're trying to downplay oh we don't have much and this and that but the Romans let's make no mistake about it they were wanting the money from these people and so Luke tells us 
that they went from Nazareth to Bethlehem, not probably because they wanted to, but because they were commanded to. Now, if you've got your sermon study notes and study guide for the week, I want you to look at the back. There's a map here. And there's two possible routes that scholars believe they may have taken um, to get from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now, the first one here, it's represented by the dotted line. This was probably the most traveled route, all right? So it's like going from here to Austin. Everybody's going to take 35, right? But we all know there are other ways you can get down to hill country. Uh, But this would have been the most, uh, not the most direct route, but the most traveled route, and not necessarily because it was easier or more direct, but because it avoided a place called Samaria. Notice that avoidance of Samaria. You may even look to appear that both routes avoid Samaria on this, even the the other route. Uh, You can see here, this is um, the second route that you notice on the map behind me. And the reason why I show you both of these routes is because I want to share something with you. As we consider the route that they may have taken from Nazareth to Bethlehem, it might tell us a little bit more about who Mary and Joseph were by nature. And as we try to understand Christ a little more in the context of this birth narrative, understand why Jesus might have been the type of person he was in terms of his earthly upbringing. We know who Christ was identity-wise, being fully God, fully human. But, but what was it about Jesus' upbringing that made him into the type of person uh, that he was? Because we know how important parenting is uh, in the process of raising a child. As we consider this map and this route, the red route that you see that kind of winds its way through the hills uh, and tries to follow the valleys as much as possible, although it appears to be a little less direct on this map, I want you to know that in reality, it was a shorter trip. And it was the historic route. So I liken this to like Route 66 and the dotted line to the new interstate, 40, that bypassed 66 across the U.S. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? So it changed the dynamic and the landscape of travel, and, but if you wanted to go through and catch all the historic sites and have the scenic route, and actually in this case, even having the scenic route be a little faster, um, you would have taken the red line version here. However, if you'd have done that, you would have been making a statement of faith you had no problems running into the Samaritans because you were going through the heart of Samaria if you took that trip. All right, I think that says something about Mary and Joseph, particularly if they chose to take this route uh, to get down to Bethlehem. As we consider that for just a moment, I want you to consider some of the ways in which we see Samaritans referenced in Scripture. Do you remember one of the more famous stories that Jesus told, one of the parables. Uh, Do you remember it had a Samaritan in it? You remember that parable? It was of the good Samaritan, and he contrasted the actions, the loving and kind actions of the Samaritan to a Levite and a priest, two uh, prominent Jewish religious groups that would have, you would have, when you're hearing the story, you would have expected them to act with compassion and mercy um, in helping someone in need. But Jesus kind of turns the tables and said it was a Samaritan that that did that. Typical Jewish people and even uh, in rabbinic teachings, rabbis wouldn't have talked fondly about Samaritans. And yet Jesus tells a story uh, in which a Samaritan is the hero in the story. You may also remember another story. Um, Jesus doesn't tell this story, but it's a story of one of Jesus's encounters. Do you remember he meets a woman at a well? This well would have been on this route, it would have been near the town of Sychar. All right, and so Jesus would have been familiar with this. It would have been one of the places where you would have stopped, one of the rest stops, if you will, on the trip. And so I'm sharing that with you just to say this. What does it say about Jesus if he went through Samaria? What does it say about Mary and Joseph if they traveled through Samaria? What does it say about them if they looked at the group that everyone else in their community, their religious community at least, outcast? What does it say about them that they saw these people with compassion? and as neighbors, not enemies, all right? I wanna show you some video of what this route would have looked like. You would have headed out of Galilee, and you would have gone through this terrain, all right? This is what you would have seen. You would have headed down these hills and now down into the Jezreel Valley. You might not be familiar with the term Jezreel Valley, uh, but 
You've heard of the term Armageddon? This is the valley where all the major battles were fought and where the writer John in his revelations begins to talk about this is where the last battle. This is where Abraham was when he was going to be promised, when he was promised by God the promised land. Does that look like promised land to you? No. And now this, this is looking over Pastor Adam Hamilton's shoulder. He's the uh, group we got the video from. They, that is looking into Bethlehem as you would finish. Now, as you would have left Galilee, you would have gone down the hills and you would have began to go through miles and miles and miles of olive groves. Olive trees that are still there to this day, by the way. If you go uh, in that region, there, there are olive groves that go back to the time of Christ. Some, they've, they've even got some trees that go back to first century. Now, whether they were actually there or just a small stump when it was Jesus' time, but could you imagine trees being that old that go back some 1,500, 2,000 years uh, back to the time of Christ? You would have gone through these olive groves, and these would have been historic groves. Uh, this would have been where some of the manufacturers of the olive oil, and think about the the, what's happening spiritually for Mary and Joseph is they're making this trip. Not only are they making the trip in terms of miles, but they're making the trip in terms of memories. You ever been on a trip and you stop at historic sites and landmarks? There would have been historic sites and landmarks and places for worship and places for rest all along this road. And they would have been remembering the promises that God had given to God's people as they're making this trek. It's important for us to remember that um, though we're not sure which route they took, it's important to know that this route was more than just in miles traveled. It was also in memories and in remembrance and in and something that maybe was happening to them spiritually as well. Now we finally get to the end of the trip and we get to Bethlehem. We talked about in one of the weeks that the Bethlehem was referred to as the house of bread. And I'm going to talk a little bit tomorrow night about how Christ in the manger is the bread of life and, and make that connection tomorrow. But what I want to share with you today is we talked about this idea that there was no room in the inn. Here's the problem with that traditional understanding that they went to a hotel and they went to the first maybe some guy had a chain of hotels or rest stops or um, inns in that area. And so they went to one of the places there was filled up because of all the, the people there for the census, and so they just there wasn't any place to accommodate them. That's what we've always thought. But when you look at the Greek word kataluma, which is interpreted here as in, that word is used one other time in the Gospels, and this is pretty interesting. The other time that kataluma is used is when Jesus is instructing the disciples to go into Jerusalem. Do you remember right before the crucifixion, they are going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, Remember, that's why they're there. And so Jesus instructs a couple of the disciples to go on ahead of him and to find a room, a place where they can make preparations for the Passover. The word kataluma that's used there is interpreted in that place in Scripture as guest room, or you have heard it most familiarly as the upper room. You guys heard that phrase? They were in the upper room, all right? Most likely... And in much of the modern translation of Scripture, many of the new translators are taking the concept of kataluma and that only other, which everybody's full agreement that that's an upper room in that other context, and they're coming back to this story and they're saying it is probably more reasonable to say, instead of using the term in, use the term guest room, all right? Now, when I tell you that this is a guest room rather than an inn, that doesn't mean that this wasn't a guest room or a residence that was serving as an inn for travelers, all right? But what it does open the door for is the possibility that this was someone's personal home and most likely a relative of Joseph's. Now, that changes your understanding of the story a little bit now doesn't it because all of a sudden you're thinking to yourself okay if there's a possibility that Mary and Joseph went to one of Joseph's relatives because remember this is where Joseph's hometown was this is where he grew up and they're coming and they're staying at somebody's house you know in-laws if you will and Mary is pregnant how could you tell them there's no room seems kind of harsh doesn't it all right I want to give you a practical reason why I think they didn't stay in the guest room and why they stayed in the stable. And it comes from archeological findings that they found here in Nazareth area. I wanna show you a video of a home 
that has been reconstructed in Nazareth. Uh, so this would have been very similar to a home in Bethlehem. And as you can see, it would have been made out of stone. You would have come in on this floor level. See those steps? That would be what is referred to as the upper room. It really looks like a sleeping porch, doesn't it? And in the upper room, you would have had about six to eight mats laid side by side by side by side, and that's where everyone would have slept. And the reason they would have slept up there is because by being just up at almost that, it really a second level, but you guys can see, it's kind of like if you've ever gone to Pioneer Village down there in Fort Worth, the second stories of those homes are only about seven feet, six feet, so it wasn't very high. It was maybe uh, just five or six feet off the ground, but they would have laid on those planks, and because it would have been up above most of the stone wall structure of the home, um, at night, it would have, the cool breezes would have come. It would have been a pretty comfortable place to have slept. They had an open-air kitchen, as you could see. Some homes may have had a roof over them, but most of them had kind of open-air kitchen kitchens, and we've kind of thought that uh, outdoor kitchens were kind of a new phenomenon, right? Uh, but they would have had this open-air kitchen, and what they would have done is they would have had a guest room that this is where most of the children would have slept, and this is when guests would have come. The children would have been kicked out of their rooms. How many of you do that at your house? Uh, and grandma and grandpa get to sleep in the kids' room. The kid sleeps on a pallet in your room on the floor or on the couch or wherever. That's what they would have done. They would have taken the kids out of this upper room. They would have put them in other places, maybe slept in the kitchen, all over the place. They would have put a tent up, whatever. And this is how they would have slept. Now, we read this story, and it says there was no room for them. The translation that I read this morning said because there was no guest room available for them. Now, we know that's not fully true. There was probably a guest room available for them. The person who was making the choice, the owner of the home, the innkeeper, whoever it was, was making a decision that it would be better to put this pregnant couple in the stable that would have been adjacent to the home. So if you're just thinking in your minds, if this is ground level of the home and this is the upper level, the stable area would have then been a few steps down and would have either been a dugout with some wall structure, or in some cases, depending on where the home was located, there may have been a small cave in which the home was built on top of. And if you go, remember, to the church of Nativity in Bethlehem, and I showed you pictures of that a couple weeks ago, there's a grotto, there's a cave underneath that church that, that they think historically could have possibly been the home of, of uh, where in Bethlehem uh, of Joseph's relatives where the baby Jesus was born. All right. As we look at that and consider that, we're still probably, you're, you're sitting here and you're thinking, but Pastor Corey, that doesn't make it sound any better. They still got kicked out to the stables. I don't understand that. I want to share with you something about childbirth and religious purity and the culture of the day that may open your mind to something. Assuming that Joseph's family was of modest or below modest or average income, they would have had one guest room, one upper room. There may have been six to seven, eight mats up there. There's a census going on. So the entire family, relatives, extended family, if Joseph had any other siblings, all of them would have been here probably staying at this place. So the place would have been packed, right? They would have had to make a decision where to put everybody. Now here's an argument that I think can be made for even if they were overcrowded, a practical reason why they would have put him in the stable. If you go to Leviticus 12 and you look at the ritual laws for purity, they address the issue of childbirth. And remember, this was, these were Jewish families, right? These were active religious families. Leviticus 12 notes this, when a woman gives birth to a son, she becomes unclean until the child is circumcised after eight days. If you keep reading, it says she's unclean even longer if she gives birth to a girl. I don't want to get into the theology of the difference between having a boy and why you're unclean for this amount of time and why if you have a girl you're unclean for a little extended time. Uh, they obviously had some problems uh, in the role of women at that time. I'm not going to get into all of that. But the issue here is that Mary and anybody that would have assisted her in the birthing process would have been ritually unclean. You have to understand for first century Palestinian uh, Jews, this is important, being ritually clean. It may be that putting them in the stable was out of necessity to make sure the rest of the household was clean and perhaps was the best they could do. All of a sudden, that changes 
your picture of the story, doesn't it? Just a little bit, maybe. That, that, that this, we sing the song tomorrow night, we'll sing the song, and I don't want to ruin it for you, we'll sing Silent Night, Holy Night, and think that everything was quiet, and there was a baby sleeping peacefully, and didn't cry, and I wonder what it felt like for Mary. Talk about journeys that take twists and turns and don't go the direction we want. Could you imagine Mary out in the stable, the garage, if you will, that's where they stored the livestock and everything left over, those tools that they only used on occasion. They would store all of that there in the stable. Could you imagine Mary on that night Contractions start and she's there on the birthing stool and there's perhaps a midwife there to help her through, maybe a relative, maybe a friend, maybe somebody. Joseph may or may not even be in the stable with her at that moment. And Mary can hear all the commotion going on just above her and all the family gathering and singing and eating and excited about this baby that's gonna be born but also excited about just seeing each other, almost this reunion, if you will. They're not happy about it being tax season, but they're glad to see each other. Could you imagine Mary sitting on that birthing stool in between contractions is, is crying and saying, you know, I, I just, it wasn't supposed to be like this. I, I, I'm giving birth to my firstborn child in my in-law's barn. I, I just didn't picture my life would end up like this. And I wonder how many times along the way in the journey Mary thought that. Boy, I'm hearing everybody tell me how blessed I am. And man, I even early in the pregnancy, I even sang that song a blessing myself. But man, this, does that feel like a blessing to you? That your child, the first night it's gonna lay down is not gonna be on a nice mat and a sleeping porch because you had all this luxury and this space, but it's gonna be in the stable with the stench and the smell and the same place the animals come to feed is where you lay your precious baby. And I wonder Mary thinking to herself that night, this is not, this is not how it was supposed to be. And then perhaps maybe the midwife or even Joseph being adjacent to what's happening, maybe one of them says to Mary, I know this isn't what you thought it would be, but you're gonna see God is here and there's gonna be a blessing come out of this, I know. Maybe the midwife said to Mary, you know, I've, I've helped ladies give birth in worse places. I share all of this with you, not to say, oh, this is exactly how it happened. I don't know how it happened. Luke just doesn't give us enough detail. He just says, uh, it came time to, for the baby to be born. <laughs> That's it, thanks, Luke. Would have been nice to have had a little more detail, and Luke gives us so much detail in, in Acts, but, but very little here. I, I read this, and I, I share all this with you just to say this. Guys, we take journeys so often in our lives that, that end up having twists and turns we never expected. And one of the beautiful things about this whole story is that there are twists and turns all along the way that people put on Mary and Joseph. All right, a greedy Roman emperor, thousands of miles away, forces them to move in the ninth month, perhaps, of Mary's pregnancy, take a nine, 10 day journey. How difficult would that have been? Probably not real excited about having to take that trip, probably ready to, to give birth and to settle in Nazareth, and yet God can still take the greed of that emperor and force it into his divine purpose and plan. Because then all of a sudden, what does the prophecy become? Fulfilled, right? Because the Savior will be born in Bethlehem. Wasn't Mary and Joseph's choice to go to Bethlehem. An emperor forced him to do it, and yet God still used it to bring about his purpose. Then they go down, and they're gonna stay with the family, but because there's so many people there, it wasn't normal time. See, in a normal time, they would have cleared everyone else out of the home and they would have probably been given the sleeping porch and there would have been a beautiful setting for them it would at least in that context would have been much better than the stable and yet God in his divine purpose and wisdom uses even that decision whether it was an innkeeper or a relative of Joseph to use that for his glory and his purposes and now that becomes the most beautiful part of the story doesn't it for us and has all the theological meaning that Jesus is the bread of life and that's the place where animals and all creation comes to feed. All of a sudden, there's a spiritual theological meaning in Jesus being born in a stable. 
I share all this with you and I sum up to say this. I think it's not hard to imagine Mary wondering, is this really how it was supposed to be? I think of the families, and I, and I want to ask you to pray for them. There are families that will worship with us tomorrow night that will be here and in church for the first time, maybe for many of them in years. Some of them for the first time ever. There will be people worshiping with us tomorrow evening that are worshiping for the first time without a child that they lost this year. There will be people worshiping with us for the first time without a spouse or a parent or a friendship or without a job. There'll be people here that are worshiping, that are singing the Christmas songs and praising God and part of their hearts and part of where they are in their journey, they'll be crying out and going, I just, God, I didn't expect that I'd be sitting here on Christmas Eve feeling like this. I share that with you because I wanna ask you all in the next days, in the next few hours, would you be intentional in prayer and go to God in prayer for families like the Betzholds, who won't be with us this year because they're traveling, but, but who are celebrating the first Christmas without Alex here? Would you lift up the Camillo family who are gonna have Christmas here just in a day, and, and just yesterday, they lost their daughter. Sawyer, how, I mean, would you lift up these families? Would you remember them? And would you also look at your own life, and some of you were sitting here this morning, you're going, man, I, I'm so thankful that all I'm worrying about is that I lost my job. I can't imagine what these other families, and you've, but yet your pain is still real. I wanna invite you to consider how God might take your journey and turn it into his journey. And that even though things might happen that will twist and turn and change the dynamic dramatically that in time you will see God at work in miraculous ways and that it'll be a story it'll be a story that reflects the love of Christ to others friends that's how Mary could say she was blessed not because she gave birth to Jesus in a stable she was blessed because in spite of giving birth to a child in a stable she was able to participate fully in God's divine plan for the salvation of the world, amen? I believe God wants that for every one of us and I ask you to remain open in your heart for God to do that. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you for this story and this journey. And there's so many details. Man, this morning's sermon just felt like a lecture uh, more than anything and, and at the same time, it's important kind of to go through those, those details and those questions and and the cultural context and the religious context in which all of this is taking place because I think it will tell us something more about your character and your character is this, is that you choose humble people to do your work. I pray that this Christmas we would humble ourselves so that you might use us to minister to someone else. I pray that as a church we would humble ourselves to be used by you that we wouldn't be about raising funds or building buildings so that we would get credit, but it would be done only and solely for your purposes and for the building of your kingdom, and that it's you are the one that gets the glory. I thank you for that. I pray that we'd be generous with our time, our talent, and our treasure in employing these gifts to your kingdom work. And I pray that along our own journeys, we wouldn't forget the journey of a young couple who at various points along the road said, this is not how we thought this would work out. And yet at the end, Mary was blessed to watch her son grow up and to have an incredibly effective ministry, but then go through the grief of having to bury her son. But Lord, we also know that that too was not the final word. For in three days, Jesus would rise from the grave. I pray that as we celebrate this Christmas season, we would not forget the fullness and the significance of Christ's birth for the salvation of our souls and for the salvation of the world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.